I've learned that it's not what I have in my life, but who I have in my life that counts. Family isn't always blood. It's the people in your life who want you in theirs, the ones who accept you for who you are, the ones who would do anything to see you smile, and who love you no matter what. Talk about your family. Which one? Before I start, as you all know, there's like a lot of things that goes on in this chapel and you've all probably heard me say this on Tuesday and I'm gonna say it one more time. Please and please and please again, be sure to one, wear your mask and cover it through your nose when you enter the chapel. Good morning, family. My name is Priscilla O. Amiel, and I am a fifth a sit from brother from Techiman, Ghana. Today, I get the opportunity to share my story with you all, and I could not be more grateful for that. Let me begin by telling you a little about myself. I was raised by two powerful single women, my grandmother, and my mother. As a young girl born into a society with significant gender inequality, I consider myself very lucky. I was allowed, I mean, growing up, there were a lot of expectations for me. I was allowed to focus on education and nothing else. There was no time for me to play or hang out with friends. My mother worked a double job so she could give me the best education she possibly could while also providing for our family. I spent a lot of my time outside the classroom with my grandma and not so much with my mom because of her jobs. I always wanted to play soccer and other sports, just like the boys in my neighborhood did. But my mother refused to let that happen. She would say, sports will not let you focus on education because you will spend too much time playing. She wanted me to focus on school only because she did not get the opportunity to do so. My grandma knew I wanted to be involved in sports, just like she had when she was young. So she supported me, but she also understood the importance of being educated. One of my mom's rules was never to step foot on a soccer field. But I could not resist playing, so I would sneak out whenever I could. I had to play the game I love. Well, I gotta tell you, I was not the best at hiding my soccer stuff from my mom. She would always find out when I had been playing soccer. In my house, there are consequences when you break a rule. I won't go into details, but I will tell you that my mom did not want me to play soccer. And well, I did not want to stop playing soccer. None of the consequences could stop me from chasing the dream of playing soccer. Because there was no girls team for my age to play with, I got introduced to an all boys soccer team. And because there are still so many social stereotypes in Ghana, I got picked on by the boys who did not want me playing with them. The boys called me names and said things like, girls belong in the kitchen. I did think of quitting the team 
because of how mean the other players were to me. But the coach convinced me not to give up. He told me there will be a girls academy trial and he wants me to take part in it. I was excited to hear the news, but in order for me to go, I needed my mom's consent. And I knew this would be very tricky to get. I told my grandma about the situation and she said she would talk to my mom for me. It took my grandma and a lot of other people to convince my mom to let me go for the trial. And even after she said yes, I knew she was not happy. I was nine, almost 10 years old, the day I went to the trial. Competing against most teenagers, I was scared stiff because I had never played in such a big arena with so many other players. I felt as if I was frozen and could not play the way I usually did. Still, my coach told me to go out and just have fun. And I made the first cut. At the second trial, there were 80 of us from all over Ghana, yet only nine of us would be awarded the scholarship. I kept getting more nervous each time a group was sent home. But I was really more worried about my school absences and how my mom was going to react than if I could make the cut. Luckily for me, I was part of the nine people who received the scholarship. The youngest one. I spent five years at the academy and during my time there, I traveled to places in the world I might not have before, like England, US, Sweden, and Denmark. I built great relationships with some of the nicest people I've ever met in my life. And most importantly, after a lot of hard work and determination, I got the opportunity to come to Westminster, a place full of love and kindness. The main purpose of this chapel is to emphasize how strongly I feel about importance of creating relationships. Leaving home at the age of 10 to pursue my dream of playing soccer and going to a better school was hard. Really tough, but by leaning on strong relationships with the people I met along the way, I was able to survive the obstacles that came my way. At the academy, I kept to myself for a long time because I was very introverted. I had self-confidence issues that affected me both on and off the soccer field. But my confidence level began to grow when I started opening up to people and building important relationships. My mentors encouraged and supported me through everything I did. When life became difficult for me at the academy, they stood by me. They made me the person I was when I came to Westie and taught me that those friendships are long lasting. When I arrived on Williams Hill, the first two people I met were my soccer captains, Blake and Georgia. These two amazing people made me feel at home right away and all the nervousness and pressure went away. Still, my third year was pretty much sort of a disaster. I spent a lot of time at the health center for a variety of reasons. I had 65, six, five class absences in my third form year. <laughs> in one of our early games against Wilbraham, I sprained my ankle. Just one of the many health issues I was battling that for. That ankle injury had begun at home in Ghana. Then I re-sprained it. 
And then I did it again, a third time. This time, badly, in our game against Taft. I then had to spend the rest of the season watching from the bench. I remember talking to Mrs. Wass and saying, I don't even know what to do. I am here to play soccer and I can't play. I remember so well when she said to me, Priscilla, you are more than just a soccer player. Looking back now, I have to thank Mrs. Annaberry, Mrs. Wass, and Mrs. Keres for all their time. I also will be forever grateful to Mrs. T for all the time I have spent with her and her family during vacations. These four remarkable teachers made the impossible seem possible. And for that, I am forever thankful. But I also want to thank all of you for helping me to make me who I am today. So many of the relationships I have developed here have helped me become a better person. Relationships are important because they make life worth living every day. Westy is my home and you all are my family. Every one of you holds a special place in my heart and always be there forever. Thank you for everything. Today is our first offertory of the year. In light of all that is going on in the world, we hope you will consider making a donation to Direct Relief, a charity that works to improve the lives of people all over the world. Today, we think of all the people in Haiti recovering from an earthquake, the people in Louisiana and the Northeast recovering from Hurricane Ida, and of course, the many, many Afghani refugees looking for a new home. Thank you for any small donation you might be able to make either here or by Venmo at Westminster Dash Martlets and label it as chapel. Now, Mrs. White has a few words for us. Tomorrow marks the 20th anniversary of the September 11th terrorist attacks on the United States, attacks that struck the World Trade Towers, the Pentagon, and a Pennsylvania field. Almost 3,000 people lost their lives directly in those attacks. Myriads of others were changed forever in their aftermath. None of the students in this chapel were born at that time, indeed. Some of your teachers were practically babes in arms then. For those of us alive and cognizant, I bet every one of us can tell you where we were standing when we first heard or saw the news. Many of us knew someone in those places. Some of us were living in those places. This terrible, terrible tragedy should not be forgotten, and it's part of our responsibility to remember and respect and educate ourselves in its aftermath. Tomorrow at 8.46 a.m., the moment of impact of the first plane, you will hear the chapel bells toll in remembrance. Today, we are together as a community, bound and blessed by Priscilla's Chapel Talk. Let's use our spiritual strength now, in a moment of silence, to pray for all of those who have been affected by the September 11th tragedy.
Thank you.